Well, welcome. Um, again, today we're talking to Hadley Wickham, uh, author of many of the books that we are reading in our book clubs, um, and of the Tideverse, and of just uh, and just a great guy who makes the art community a lot of what it is, or helps make it what it is. So, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So. Uh, a lot of our uh, questions today are around package authoring, because that is the latest book that um, mm -hmm. our first cohort has read. But we also have clubs for um, R4DS and for Advanced R going now. This has been, it's just been ballooning um, and it's really exciting. So questions may go, you know, kind of all over the R programming yeah. world. Yeah. All right, so up, up first, um, Jake Riley asked, uh, reproducible examples and the reprex package make it easier to ask for help. Um, do you have any tips for how to create a reproducible, reproducible example for something like an error with um, dev tools checks or you know something like that? It's a little t tougher. Um... I mean, th in that case, you're still like the best thing you can do. Um, like in those cases where there's like some error in our command check that I just can't figure out, I will just like progressively delete parts of the package to try and um, figure out exactly where it's coming from. Uh, and I, th I think that's useful. Like, you know, a lot of the times if you do that, you'll eventually figure out what was causing the problem anyway. And so even if, you know, if you don't need the, you know, you might eliminate the read need for a reprex because you've figured it out yourself. Um, the, the other thing, so that's kind of like the um, reductive approach. The other approach is to like start, you know, depending on the problem is to start from scratch um, with like use this and use use this to create like a little package that illustrates the problem. Um, you know, typically that that tends to be more of like a workflowy kind of question, like why doesn't this thing work? Because if you've got some package that's failing our command check, you don't know exactly what the problem was. Um, but that that's a pretty good approach too. Okay, great. Um... So uh, speaking of workflows, um, we have a series of questions here that are kind of workflow related. And the first first step is from uh, Maya Gans asking, how do you decide when something should go from just like some personal tools that you use into an actual package? Um, I mean, pretty much <laughs> everything I... <laughs> I don't really have like any of my own codes, so pretty much anything goes in a package pretty quickly. Uh, it doesn't always get like exported or documented particularly quickly, um, but often, you know, often it goes through some kind of um, process of fairly heavy usage, like internally in the Tidyverse team before we kind of publish it too widely. Um, so I think a you know a fairly good example of that is like the, the PR functions in use this, which you know we we've kind of existed for a while, but we didn't really talk about them that much and just use them a bunch internally. And I think now they're kind of at the point where we're like we'll start to advertise them more widely. Although I mean a lot of those, I mean I guess half of the PR stuff is broadly useful because it helps you make PRs. Uh, the other half is a bit more specialized because it helps you handle PRs coming in, which is obviously a you know a rarer situation. That makes sense. Um, and on that note, uh, what is your personal workflow for package authoring? Do you start with a function, with a test, with a vignette? Um, does it match the workflow that's currently in the book? Yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, normally... Normally I don't know exactly what I'm doing. Like I have sort of a vague sense of what the goal is, but I don't know how that's gonna become concrete. Um, so there's often like a lot of, like I don't, I don't like test driven development just doesn't, I think work for most of the cases that I'm working on because I don't know what the correct behavior is. <laughs> but, you know, often if I'm like trying to, if I'm trying to fix a bug, um, like the first thing I'll always do is make a reprex and then make that reprex as small as possible so I can um, 
kind of iterate quickly to find out what the root cause is. Uh, Jenny, actually, Jenny, Jenny talked about this in her keynote a little bit last year. That it turns out I'm very consistent um, with the wording I use when I reduce someone's reprex to make it smaller. And so she like she did a little analysis where she found all of the cases where I said like somewhat more minimal reprex, and then compared the lines before and after. Uh, so like for once I've got that reprex, I will sometimes like turn it into a test then and there. Um, but often like I, that won't happen until later because I, I want to understand what the like, precisely the root cause of the problem is because then that will help me create like the, the test that like narrows in on exactly the problem rather than testing like something a little broader or not immediately related. Um, so for like new stuff, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of coding, um, the tests come fairly late, um, but bugs, you know, always a reprex. And then, you know, sometimes I'll turn that into a test, but most of the time I'll figure out what the problem is and then, then make the, make the test. Great. Um, and that actually leads really well into this question from, um, Tony. Uh, what do you do with any like intermediate code when you are testing and developing uh, a function? Do you do all that in the console? Do you um, put it into, you know, like untitled, untitled number five. 200 and 470? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've like, <laughs> normally have quite a few when I'm working on a package, I have a bunch of untitled tabs <laughs> open where I'll, where I'll do that kind of stuff. Like that contains like the rubrics that I'm, currently working on and like little snippets of the answer and then every now and then I just go through and like close them all and <laughs> delete them so anything in an untitled is, is pretty feels pretty ephemeral to me and so I try um I've, I've had a few situations in the past because the, the other thing I'll do is like just whatever R studio if someone asks me a question like whatever R studio project I'll have open I'll just open an untitled up in that and then I'll forget to save the file. And then like three months later, I'll like, I'll have a very strong memory of like solving this problem. And I know it's an untitled in some project that I've had open the last three months, but I can never find it again. So I've been trying to get better, like just like saving those on a desktop or somewhere at least that I can find them again. Um, that's, that's very heartening to hear, I'm sure, because you know many of us have those untitled ghosting just where the heck where was that um kind of you know uh in a different direction but uh maya was asking do you know <laughs> do you know how the whole heck sticker thing started with our packages so i um remember seeing it uh a long time there's this like hex bin um site which defines the sick the the sticker spec, which um, I can't, who, which was done by, some, I feel like a Max, someone. Let's see if I can find this on the GitHub. <laughs> yeah, Max Ogden, I guess, kind of did this, I guess, around 2015. And I, do not remember how I came across it. Maybe it was at an O'Reilly conference or something similar. And I just thought it was like a cool idea. So I <laughs> copied it for a bunch of, well, this is like pre tidyverse, but uh, a bunch of packages that are now on the tidyverse. And then it just seems to like, you know, other, other, other programming communities have some things that have hex stickers as well, but there's no other programming community that it's like, it's almost like a, a the cost of doing business. If you if your package doesn't have a hex sticker in the R community, it's like not a real package. <laughs> um, so just something about it, I think, really resonated with the R community, and it just just kind of exploded. Um, and I, you know, I love that it's just like a little a little place if you would have fun and kind of show off some of the, the creativity, like outside of programming that 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 people have. Definitely agree. All right. Um, so. Now I have, we have a fairly specific question, but um, I think, um, you know, could be generally useful. So uh, Corrado Lanera has a package that they want to make available on GitHub um, because they think it, it's generally useful, but it has enhanced functionality for their team um, when they have, when they use a private package. Um, 
you know, when they have that package installed. So yep. what would you do in the description in that case to minimize, you know, complaints from our command check and um, from people trying to install the package? <laughs> in that case, I <laughs> don't know if I feel comfortable giving this advice and seeing my public. Um, but in that case, I would like if it's a package, if it's going to, if you want your package to go on CRAN and it provides um, kind of conditional functionality of some non CRAN packages installed, I would just like effectively make it a suggested package but uh, not actually declare it as a suggested package and then use some trick so that our command check didn't notice that you were actually using that package in your package. So it didn't cause any warnings. And then accept like, you know, if you, if you do that, I, I think that it's fine to do that as long as you accept the risk that if that ever causes problems, um, CRAN will be extremely pissed off at you. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you did that, I'd also want to make sure I, you know, you have a very, you know, very carefully check that and make sure you've got some, um, some GitHub Actions continuous integration stuff set up so that you, you know, find out any problems before they affect anyone else and you can fix it pretty quickly. Okay, that, that makes sense. I think he was even saying, or here they were saying that, um, even without putting it on CRAN, you know, they just want to be able to take advantage of all the texting or tech testing infrastructure that there is. Um, yeah, that's a little, um, <laughs> I think that's fine. As long as it's, a, if it's just on GitHub then you can make it a suggested package and then you just make sure that you can use like, if, and you're in examples, you'd have to check examples, tests, and vignettes. You'd have to make sure that the package is installed before running anything that depends on it. Yeah. Um, and, and in tests, that's pretty easy because you can just use skip if, if skip if not installed. Right. Okay. Um, somewhat on a related note, uh, Jake Riley asked So, when you use a, pack, a function from another package, you can explicitly namespace that function. You can use import from, or you can import the entire package. Yep. Um, and you have some notes in the R packages book about like how to make that decision. Yep. Do you have kind of a standard that you follow of when you import from versus when you import versus when you namespace? So there's only like a few, like import is the easy one because there's only like very, there are very few cases in which we, which we do that and in general, like as soon as you import more than one package, you're kind of exposing yourself to some future risk that your package will break when if either of those two packages introduce a function that's duplicated across them. Um, so which, which is like a little, which I would never do with like oh, someone else's packages because it's basically letting someone else, that, that just is a very easy way for someone else's innocuous change to break your, break your package in an annoying way. Um, so we, as a general rule, like we import, the only package we import routinely is Arlang, um, just because we use that in a bunch of places now, because there's a bunch of like little, um, you know, improvements for things that, that just lets us work a little bit more efficiently. And we've kind of accepted that that's, you know, basically a dependency of everything we do. So in most cases, like as long as it's not the first package you're installing it, the Arlang is kind of a free dependency and it, um, it gives us enough enough um, benefit that we think it's worth the cost of doing that. And, and Arlang itself has no dependencies. So that's import. Basically, we only ever import Arlang. Um, you know, if you look around, you'll probably find a few exceptions uh, I think they're mostly historical these days and we're trying to gradually move away from it. Um, so then the distinction is between using colon colon and at import from. And generally, I think I like start with, I almost always start with colon colon uh, and then switch to at import from like when, it become, when that becomes annoying, like when you start, <laughs> it starts to become hard to read the code because there's so much namespacing going on. Um, the other place where, we, where you have to add import from something is if you are providing a method for a generic 
in another package, you have to import the generic. So the Roxygen machinery and the uh, namespace machinery can find the kind of information about the generic so the method can be registered correctly. Uh, so I, I think that's the, that's the place where we mostly use at import from in tidyverse packages. Um, you know, that said, I see like a lot of, you know, we don't write many packages that use dplyr and ggplot2 extensively. Uh, and so I suspect if I was doing that, I would be tempted to like at import from like a bunch of just standard dplyr functions like import group by summarize mutate filter, blah, blah, blah. And then just, you know, gradually build that out over time. That makes sense. Um, and then Jake had a, a separate question, but very related. Um, when you want to reference exported data from within the same package where that data is exported, um, such as in a default value or within a function, what should you do so that it works when the package isn't libraried? Uh, do you namespace it? Uh, you're better off not doing <laughs> that. I think if you have a, if you have data that you want to use as a default value, you shouldn't put it in the data directory, but instead make it like the internal data, which goes in sysdata dot rdb, I think. Uh, and then you could like explicitly export that if you wanted. Okay. Um, just because data, if you actually look, um, if you look at the source code of, um, colon, colon, let's just put that up. If you look at the source code for colon, colon, you see it calls this function called get exported value. And if you look at get exported value, you'll see it actually has a separate branch for data. So data kind of works a little bit differently to every other exported object in the package, which is why you can't, which, you know, why it behaves a little differently. And this is sort of, I think partly a historical artifact of the way that the load, lazy loading works so that if a, a package provides a large data set, that data set is never actually introduced into memory until you refer to it for the first time. And so, you know, if you're, so that, that kind of machinery just interacts in awkward ways if you want to use it as an argument or something. So we generally not, not do that. Either data is like, for examples, or if you're using it for your, you know, if, it, if it's some data that has to be, you know, made and that's used for computation, um, I wouldn't put that in the data directory. Okay. And there's a um, little bit on that in our packages. I think we call it, or if you use, like use, if you use, use data, it's internal equals true. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Tony asked, uh, why does Roxygen use camel case while pretty much everything else you do uses snake case? Um, I think GG proto objects also use camel case and, and in general, do you have like a internal rule of when it's snake case, when it's camel case? Or is it uh, I mean, Roxygen too, I think that was just an artifact. So like <laughs> the, the original author of Roxygen two was, um, Peter Dannenberg, who did it as a Google summer of code, like, I don't know, 10 plus years ago. Um, and he used um, camel case. And there's just, there's like sufficient, well, I guess there's quite a few compound. Just, it's just not really worth the effort to like change that. And it somehow feels, I don't know, it feels fine <laughs> to me, probably <laughs> just cause I'm so used to it. That doesn't even occur to me. Uh, and you know, similarly like for GG Proto, that's just the stuff like that, you know, really old stuff. I, I think a little bit like if I write R6, like R6 class names or GG Proto class names would normally use upper camel case. And then it kind of feels natural to use lower camel case for the methods. Uh, I don't know if we're particularly consistent about that and, <laughs> Generally, we don't kind of expose those objects to the outside world, so it doesn't matter so much. But, you know, I think our role would be like anything new, snake case. Okay, that makes sense. Um, 
and I guess this is uh, related. Um, there's the famous quote from Phil Carlton that there are two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Um, you recently went through a big renaming process for spread and gather in tidy R. Yeah. Do you have any tips for how to name things? Um, in general, your function names tend to make sense. And so is there any rules you use to get there? That's just really, really tough. And I think you have to kind of accept that you're going to make mistakes along the way. Um, one thing we've started to do a little bit now is um, kind of hold our best names back because often we'll realize it's not just the name of the function, but the interface of the function that's wrong. And so we need to do a whole new function. And then if you've kind of already used your best names, then the kind of second iteration, the second attempt, which is going to be better, has to have like inferior, inferior names. Um, otherwise, it's mostly um, it's like a lot of um, just sort of brainstorming and using the thesaurus a bunch. Uh, I think one one thing that was Let's see if I can dig it up. I think one other thing that worked out really nicely, though, I think there's a little bit of, let's see if I can find this, it was the naming of uh, dply relocate. Um, let's see if I can find the issue. Okay. Yeah, I think this is it. I'll uh, just put in the chat. So this was the, the goal was to come up with a new verb in dplyr that let you move columns around. And so kind of the initial proposal was move. But move is like a like a, it's a four letter word, like it's a pretty general word. And it feels like this is a pretty sp specific use case. So move um, wasn't that great. So there were a bunch of suggestions like reorder, graph, transplant, revamp, reorganize, reshuffle. Um, and so then I, I kind of said, well, like I wanna, it really it needs to it kind of feel like select and rename because it's very much in the same family as those functions, which is ideally, you know, like five to seven letters, two syllables, and start with a letter in the letter, letter part of the al al um, alphabet. And then um, I guess I came up with the rotate there and then it wasn't until sometime later, I was just like relocate, like it occurred to me, I was like, oh, this is perfect, like it's the, about the right number of syllables, it kind of sits, like if you see select, rename and relocate together, they all kind of look like they belong. Um, but, but that's an example of like a very high stakes kind of function, like adding a new verb to dplyr is kind of a big deal. We, we always spend a bunch of time on it. Uh, and you know, in other cases, um, and the other thing with dplyr is the dplyr verbs don't use, don't have a common prefix for better or worse, which means we need to be a little bit more careful about clashes with other um, packages or other base functions. Um, so in, in other, in other um, packages, it feels a little less lower, sta lower stakes because you've got this kind of prefix on the start, which like implicitly scopes it. So kind of all the things kind of hang together. Um, but yeah, it's tough. Um, I sometimes think like if I um, ever get sick of our programming, I'll um, become like a naming consultant and help people come up with names for new products. That seems like kind of a fun job. And there's like five people in the world who are like really good at it and earn like a huge amount of money to name, come up with names of new like washing detergents and stuff. So it seems like a fun job. It does. All right. Um... So now we have uh, several questions that are kind of about um, working in open source. Um, and so to start it off, Maya asked, uh, when you release a package, how much does like the obligation of maintaining that package 
factor into um, your work? Um, I'd say it's not so much. I mean, again, it's like a little different. I'd say like not at all anymore for me because if I get sick of it, <laughs> I can just make someone on my team look after it instead. Um, which obviously doesn't generalize particularly well. <laughs> um, but I, I think in general, like that's something that I worry about a lot less than I used to because, you know, I'm you know now really well resourced through our studio and we've got plenty of people to work on this stuff. Um, that's it. Like most packages, um, like it's not... Like I think that the, like the, the, the packages that... that I kind of think about this the most with I like pa like old packages that we basically like don't work on anymore, but continue to keep alive on CRAN. Like if 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 a, if a package is like um, you know basically dormant, like if you're not making changes to it, just doing enough fixes to keep it on CRAN so that people can keep using it is um, not a lot of work. So like the reshape and reshape two packages. You know, I have to put in like a couple of hours of work every couple of years just to fix any new R command check notes that come up. And I am basically, you know, like, like I will be obligated to those until I die, basically. <laughs> um, and that's, um, so it's, it doesn't feel to me like it's a huge obligation. Um, again, you know, it's tough for me to kind of give that answer because, I, you know, I'm developing packages all the time, like when, you know, Reshape 2, I guess, that th I mean, with Reshape, like Reshape is the worst because it was written so long ago. Like it doesn't use any of the tools that I'm familiar with anymore. Um, so I think Rock I think Reshape 2 is like before, it was like well before DevTools, it was well before Roxygen. I don't think it uses, um, doesn't use test that. So like when something goes wrong, like I've literally, I have to like, bring back all of this like stuff that I've forgotten about how it works. And then when I make a change, like if I make any changes, I'm very nervous I'll break something because there aren't any tests. And, um, but still like it just, yeah. But again, then those packages are still so used by enough people as worth putting the time into it. Um, yeah, so it doesn't factor into my decisions at all, but it probably should factor into yours, but I am the, Long person to ask. I got him off that slide. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, well, the, you might not be the best person for this, as, or either, but uh, we got into a whole conversation along these lines last night. And uh, Asma asks, um, What can we do to help ensure the longevity of a package if something arises with the maintainer? Uh, what steps have you seen that led to success in that regard? What should we do to keep packages we like from being orphaned? Um, and then that led into like, just is open source uh, sustainable long-term and what makes it sustainable? Yeah, so I mean, CRAN has this kind of, um, I mean, I think the orphan status is actually a kind of a good fallback. So basically a package will get orphaned if it is used by other packages uh, the main, and the maintainer doesn't respond to requests for feedback. And when a package is orphaned, that means kind of like anyone can potentially take it over. Um, you know, ideally you want to do this, um, you know, with the, the blessing of the original maintainer. Um, but if they like don't respond, and in some cases, you know, that might be because they did. Um, you know, you just have to, you, you know, that this gives us kind of a, a, a community and out like to rescue packages. And, you know, I think we as a team have really done that a, a couple of times, like there have been packages that um, people, um, you know, just moved away from the R community and, you know, we've taken over the, the maintenance of them because they're important and it's, you know, it's good to keep that alive. Um, that's also part of the idea of this RLIB uh, organization that we have on, um, on GitHub that um, like the tidy, like it's particularly important for the tidyverse packages because they're used by so many people that um, like ideally before we take a dependency on an 
uh, important external package. It, you know, if it's really important, like I would generally reach out to the maintainer and say like, I, I want, you know, I kind of want right of first refusal. If you get sick of maintaining this package, like please reach out to us first so that we can, you know, take it over if needed. And then there's, these sort of, there's a, a few packages in RLib maintained by other people. And, and basically any package in RLib is sort of a guarantee that someone on my team will take it over if the original maintainer ever, you know, gets sick of it. So that, that's sort of how we think about it. Like, um, you know, I think we have a slightly like longer view because, you know, we're, we're paid to do this, which is much more sustainable. And so we, we want to make sure that all of the things that we depend on are going to be around in, in 10 years time. So our code can keep on working. Um, but, you know, often before it gets to that point, like often it's, you know, if there's just total, you know, like in many cases, people just need like a, a hand, like there's a lot of people who are not expert R package maintainers and they have problems on CRAN and they've got no idea what to do and they've got a bunch of other stuff going on in their lives and it never gets the, the top of their priority list. And often, you know, just an email saying like, hey, you know, is there anything we can do to help or, you know, doing a pull request which fixes the problems is, it seems to be you know, very much appreciated and kind of keeps things um, ticking along without, um, without um, any problems. I, I think one thing we sh probably should try and address um, with CRAN slash R core is currently the way that you declare that someone is a maintainer of the package is to give them like the creator role in the description file. And so that, you know, that's a little awkward. Like when you, um, when someone else takes over maintainership from the original, um, original maintainer, like how do you, how do you recognize that? So I think one thing we did in, um, Magrita, where this is a case of um, a package that was maintained by someone who's now, you know, kind of moved away from the R community by and large, and Leonel's become the maintainer. So, um, you know, we just tried to recognize that with a, a comment, so we can keep, you know, make it very clear that Stefan was the original, original author and creator, uh, even though someone else is the maintainer now. Makes sense. Um, so we also that that kind of uh, leads into, um, and if if you uh, can answer a question like this, but why is the CRAN team so small? Like it's so important. Is that by design, or is it just that nobody wants to do the job? It's thankless, or um, you know, basically, what can we do to make their work easier? Because we don't. You know, we need grand. Yeah, I think unfortunately there's not much like anyone can do about it. Um, you know, it's a small team who have been doing this for a long time and have um, you know, very strong opinions about how things should work and by and large want to keep like the crown itself so there's, there's very little you can do i think the, the most important thing you can do uh is never respond to an email from cran like never get into an argument with them because it just sucks up everyone's time you're better off just like just treat it like a. you have to treat um you know if you're familiar with the paper review process you have to treat it like a paper review like there's no point arguing with them you just have to accept their comments and make the changes and then you know move on with your life and getting into like a long email thread with them just you know sucks up their time makes them unhappy and will make it you unhappy as well makes sense um so okay um the r community is already um you know, relatively good compared to a lot of other programming languages when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But do you have any uh, perspectives on how we can bring more DEI to our development? Yeah, so I think the two, um, I think the kind of two areas of concern to me are like, um, like when you look at the R community, it, it's 
I think like so I think the thing that the, the R community is doing really well right now is particularly like gender diversity amongst R users. Uh, I think the weakness is like is when you start looking at like um, you know, our package developers, I think that's starting to, to change a little bit, um, but it's still kind of early days. It's still um, like overwhelmingly white dudes. And um, I think, you know, particularly kind of um, racial diversity now is something that I, um, that's sort of something that that's more top of mind to me. Cause I think our ladies has just been so like tremendously, incredibly successful um, and so I even feel like in terms of, I think that, that, that as that, as that um, group of people mature, they will just naturally start writing more, writing more packages. And, um, you know, it's certainly not something that you know, we'll just, just ignore, but I think that it just feels like that is all moving in a very positive direction where it's not so clear, um, kind of the, you know, the, the racial diversity of our users and our contributors and, um, I think in just, you know, how that, I don't know, like, I I don't really know what the answers are there. Um, and I'm sort of trying to, you know, figure that out mm -hmm. myself, what more, you know, I can do, what my team can do, and what our studio can do, generally. Okay. Um, so this packet, or this question's a little bit out of place in this group, but um, maybe a little lighter <laughs> uh, uh, note, but... Uh, Maya asked, how do you decide um, the scope of a package and when to split a package into multiple packages? I don't know. It feels to me like the, I, I, this is something I cannot articulate very well, but it's something like there needs to be like some core idea at the heart of everything that's like related to together. And that like understanding what that core idea is like, changes over time um like you you know it's sort of like peeling back layers of the onion like it takes a while to figure out what the, the core idea is and um so yeah so i think you just you no know, it's just some kind of sense some weird sense to me of like do these things kind of hang together like can you explain yeah you know, relatively concisely, what is the commonality across all of these functions? Uh, and, you know, sometimes you put functions in a package because it seems like the best place and it doesn't they don't quite fit. And sometimes later on you realize, oh, they don't fit because they actually should be in this package or actually you need to change this to make them fit together. But I think that that kind of like striving for that kind of cohesiveness and this sort of shared vision, I think it makes a package easier to understand because, it's not just a, like a conglomeration of random things. It's things that are related in some way. Um, I mean, I think that's like the hardest, I think one of the most rewarding, but hardest parts of my job is kind of figuring out like names for things that we don't have names for. And that is like, like once you've got a name for a, a concept, it's much, much easier to talk about it and think about it. But until you get to that point, it's like very, very difficult. And so that, you know, part of creating a package is kind of making that nebulous idea concrete. And you just have to kind of accept you'll get it wrong and occasionally get to the breaking point where it feels like it's going to be less work on the long run to break the package apart and like start clarifying the, the various pieces and leave them as they are. That makes sense. Uh, on a related note, um, I also was asking, like, how do you um, triage issues and uh, including especially making the call that something's out of scope for a package? Uh, basically, do you have any advice on how to say no? Uh, I think like the, I think the, the, the um, I think the challenge of saying no is like primarily like psychological. You need to figure out how do you increase your level of comfort, like telling people no. And, you know, that is, you know, the, the, the degree of difficulty in that is like very much like, if, are you like a people pleaser or not? And like that, that, that's just a bunch of kind of personality characteristics and kind of, I'm not, like for better or worse, like by and large, I don't care that much about what people think. Um, so it's like relatively easy for me 
but I think the thing that has been helpful is like accepting like any, you know, anything like it's, it's always more work. Like this is where the maintenance of burden of a package comes in. Like when you start adding things, particularly if those things are not related to like the core purpose of that package, it just becomes like it gets harder to maintain them and harder to keep them working. And some things you over time, you get a sense of like, you're just opening the door to a huge amount of future work. And it's better to say no now rather than to let that drag out over multiple times, um, you know, multiple years. You know, I think in general, like the, the techniques are like, it's better to, the, you know, some of the other techniques I use are, it's better to say no now than in six months time or a year's time. Like a quick no is better than, you know, a quick no is not as good as a yes, but it is a lot better than a no that takes like multiple years to arrive. Um, I think you also need to think of like issues are not um, issues are not precious. They're not like your your babies. Um, if something really is a problem and you close an issue too soon, someone else will file an issue about that same thing. And sometimes it's that like repeated message that many people are experiencing the same problem as what like has to trigger you that this is something that you should actually think about. And I think finally, just like spending some time to write like a um, empathetic and polite no is really useful. Like once you've got that no, then you can like recycle it in, in multiple places. And that just helps, you know, you can, I now have like a, a couple of ones for like, you know, thanks if, you know, like it's some, there's, I've got two ones. One that's like acknowledging, yes, this is a bug. I'm really sorry it breaks your code but we're going to make the call not to fix it because the cost of it is too high relative to the benefit. Like that sucks, but uh, this issue is still like, it's still indexed in Google. And if other people find it, you know, they can upvote it and maybe it'll, it'll get to the point where we believe it's worthwhile. And then the other one is just is for issues like, sorry, you know, it's a great idea. Um, like totally nothing wrong with the idea, but it just doesn't like one of the things we really believe in is that, good software development is about focus and keeping things really like concise and contained. And so we unfortunately have to say no to your idea. And, you know, most ideas, um, you know, most things we do say no to. Um, so there's a sort of unfortunate asymmetry in that, like most of what I have to tell people about the issues is no, no, we don't want, no, we don't want this new feature. Um, that's, I think, a, you know, part of being a, the so software developer, software maintainer. Um, kind of related to that, we had uh, just in the chat, Jake asked, um, what do you think about, or do you have an opinion on the new discussions on GitHub? Yeah, I, we have not looked into them yet. Um, I think that, two reasons for my hesitation are firstly, like really we want like an organization wide discussion, not one that's necessarily, like a lot of packages are small enough that having an individual discussion forum is just like no one will ever read them. It's just too small. It would be much better to have a kind of a tidyverse wide discussion forum. Uh, and then the second concern is just like, it's just another venue it's like another place for us to monitor and help people learn how to use it effectively and for us to learn how to use it effectively. Um, so I think we will, you know, we'll just kind of see how that plays out a little longer. Uh, you know, it's nice in that it's kind of has some mix of um, Stack Overflowy plus discussion-y type things. So questions can be like answered and have like an official answer and then things that are pure discussion you can just, you know, discuss along the way. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna, I think we're just adopting a wait and see approach right now. That makes sense. All right. So, um, this year you released test that, uh, version three, which introduced the concept of an addition. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you decide to do that rather than releasing it as like a new package, like ggplot2 or um, Jenny Bryan's Google Sheets 4? Basically because so much of it is the same, like test the third edition of test that is like, I don't know, 95% the same as the previous version. 
and it's really it's not like a fundamental like rethinking it's not like all of the function names have changed or there's some different organizing principle it's more like a shrinking of the api to say there's a bunch of stuff that we now kind of regret and we think you shouldn't use but we can't just deprecate that for everyone because there's you know, 5,000 odd packages using testnet today and we don't want to break thousands of people's code. Um, so the addition just seemed like a nice compromise. Like you can opt into the new behavior if you want to, otherwise you stay with the old behavior. And that is like overall less maintenance burden than having two separate packages because there's so much in common between the two. And then there's just a few places in um, test that that just have an F statement. Like if it's third edition, do this. If it's second edition, do something else. Fair enough. Um, so uh, Maya asked, do you have any tips for how to get people to collaborate uh, with you on an open source project? And this might be something that another one of these where you can't answer because you're in a fairly unique position. I mean, I think in but general, so, um, so I think that the one, uh, let's see if I can remember the name of it. There's a really <laughs> good book about this, um, about, uh, yeah, working in public. Let's put a link in the chat. Um, by Nadia, oops. <laughs> working in public by uh, Nadia Igbal, which I'd highly recommend reading because it's like not every open source project is kind of fundamentally about collaboration with multiple people. And indeed, I think most, the majority of open source projects are not. And so if you spend all your time trying to get people to kind of collaborate with you, it's gonna be ultimately frustrating because it's very, very difficult to find those, those people. Um, so, you know, again, that, that's, you know, I think we, um, I mean, again, like now, for now the way I find collaborators is to hire them. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it is, it's just, I think it is really like even hiring people is like really, really difficult. Like, like forming that, you know, you are, you're building, a, I think you have to think about it as building a relationship. Um, and you have to accept that the, like the, the, the person, that, there's not that many people out there with the right combination of skills and the kind of personality that will fit well with yours. So I think the main, the main thing is just to appreciate that that's really, really difficult and don't be, you know, don't be taken aback if it takes a long time or you find it very difficult. Okay. Um, on a kind of, on the other side of that coin, um, John Leslie asked, uh, how does the Tidyverse team structure work for package development? How do you divvy up what to do on a package as a team? Basically, how do you, run a team on package development. <laughs> Basically, it's built around the principle that it's very difficult to collaborate with other people. <laughs> um, so in, in most cases, like, you know, most packages kind of have like someone who is, you know, primarily responsible for it. Uh, I think at the same time, like we try and avoid, like it's not your package, the package is kind of collectively owned um, so that you shouldn't, like if someone, you know, criticizes the package, you don't need to feel personally attacked and that anyone is, you know, in the tidyverse is potentially free to contribute to it. But by and large, you know, like Thomas looks after ggplot2, Raman looks after um, Dplyr, uh, Gabor looks after all of the package, a lot of the package development infrastructure. Like most packages have like an owner and while, you know, other members of the team will kind of stop in and do PRs from time to time, like by and large is one, you know, one package is owned by one person who drives the, you know, probably 90% of the development. Just because like getting, like having multiple people working on this thing at the same time just introduces all of these coordination costs. Um, so I think that like by and large, is a strength because we can work independently. Um, we have these kind of loose guidelines that keep everything consistent. But on the downside, like we're not very good at tackling projects that require like multiple, like that are big enough that multiple people need to be working on them simultaneously. Like that is not something I think we're particularly good at as a team or something, you know, hopefully we'll try and get better at it in the future. Okay. 
think we have a few more minutes. So we've got some questions from the chat. Um, so how, how do you feel about the, actually we've got two different questions about this. Um, how do you feel about the base R pipe um, and how do you think it will impact uh, Magritter? I mean, I, I think that the fact that there is a base R pipe now is, you know, kind of like a tremendous compliment that, you know, base R is, R core is recognized that this thing actually really is useful and they want to adopt it. And, you know, this is not something that happened in kind of isolation. There are a lot of discussions behind the scenes with, with um, me and Jim and Leonel in particular and our core to kind of work out, work out the details. So I think overall, it's, it's a great thing. And I think in the long run, um, it's gonna, you know, eliminate the need for Magrita in you know, 90% of cases. Um, how are we gonna kind of roll that transition out? I don't have a good sense of yet because the, um, like, I think we want to we want to move towards the base pipe just, you know, because it's better to have one thing that everyone uses than a, a whole variety of slightly different things. Um, part of the reason for Magrita 2 is that the Magrita pipe now works much more similarly to the, the base pipe. It's not exactly the same, but um, the places where the cases are different are now much smaller. Uh, and then we need to figure out, like, how are we going to, like, slowly convert our packages to use the pipe? The challenge is that, um, you know, we have this promise in the tidyverse that tidy all tidyverse packages work on the current and last five versions of r so that means we can't depend on the pipe right away because if you use the pipe and all the versions of r it's obviously not going to work so we have to figure out some some way of of breaking that deadlock so we can switch our packages to use the pipe sooner than in five years time all right um so, and again, this might be one where you're kind of out of the mindset to be an, able to answer it, but um, do you have any advice on when to take, when to submit a package to CRAN rather than just keeping it on GitHub? Okay, I think the, I mean, I think if you, if you care about a package, you should submit it to CRAN. Like it, it can be painful, you know, I don't wanna, um, Conceal that, but the vast majority of, for like most for most packages, most of the time, like it is very painless. Particularly if you follow follow the advice in in our packages, um, you know, most of the time now, like we, I think there's some stuff that we haven't like written up yet, and it's a little tricky because it's in flux. The initial submission always, but like us internally now, our success rate for getting a package on CRAN on the first attempt is you know, probably 90%, 95%. Um, so I, like I, you know, it's, it's absolutely possible that you can have a really negative experience with submitting to CRAN, but that is like, thankfully pretty unusual. So I don't think that should weigh it against you. And you can avoid most of the negative times by never, never getting into an email back and forth with CRAN. Like if they ask you to do something and it doesn't make sense to you, or you don't understand or like ask on a mailing list, ask and ask for your community, ask on Twitter, like find some other way to get the answer rather than going back and forth with them. And, you know, for pretty much every problem that you, you know, every problem that you've experienced, someone else has experienced already and worked out, you know, it's the right thing to do. And it's just a matter of finding that person and, and getting them, getting their help so your package can go through smoothly. Okay. And uh, I think that's going to have to do it. We're going to have to wait for the blog post for um, the thought process on relicensing all the uh, tidyverse packages because I think that that will take more than a minute to answer. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank you very much. Uh, this has been great, and um, just thank you for being here. Cool. Thanks again for having me. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.